Hello everyone, good morning and I'd like to welcome you all to the episode 4 of My Leader's Life. So My Leader's Life is a series of uh, uh, say episodes where we, in, where we invite uh, world leaders from across the globe in the design strategy and innovation space to come in and talk about uh, the importance of design strategy and innovation in their lives, in their project, in their work, especially in times like these. So uh, My Leader's Life is brought to you by Mind Global, which is an initiative by Manipal Global and Spread. Uh, Spread is a global design strategy and innovation firm with its centers in Bangalore, in India and Brussels in Belgium. And uh, since the launch of uh, the Creative Leadership Program on uh, Sunday, May 2nd, uh, we have had an overwhelming response for, from each and every one of you. We have more than 5,000 people visiting our website, more than uh, 100, 1,500 registrations for all the episodes till now, uh, more than almost we have uh, 100 people live right now, and uh, we, have, we are closing 100 applications to the program. So thanks a lot for the overwhelming response that we have had. So uh, now I'll move on to quickly introducing our speaker for the day. Uh, as already mentioned over all of our social media, he's an innovation master, designer by training, strategist by practice, a design pedagogy expert, a product and UX designer, educator, uh, a NID graduate, uh, very well known across the globe for uh, as a brand architect, professor, speaker, and activist. Thanks, Arvind, for joining us. Uh, welcome to episode. Thanks for uh, taking out time of your super busy schedule to be here on Mind Leaders Live. And uh, with this, I would like to quickly proceed towards the session. Cool. So I'll I'll just throw it at you, Arvind, on um, how do you feel about the current situation and on, on where we are right now. How does it make you feel? Um, thank you and welcome everyone. Um, this is my first ever experience at hosting a kind of talk like this, uh, you know, pandemic, pan global. So to go back to the question, well, uh, to be honest, I'm not feeling particularly optimistic right now in my own kind of personal way, because I think while some of us have the kind of entitlement and privilege of, of you know, sitting here and, you know, participating in this kind of intellectual activity and having really meaningful conversations and discussions, there's a huge number of people that we don't see. Um, and, and they are actually in a pretty bad shape and it's a worse shape than they were. Uh, so the situation is not really uh, optimistic as it stands. I'm going to just switch to the, the my screen PowerPoint so that uh, I can start. That really it, it is it for me. I mean, we are right now in the middle of a kind of disruption. That's for sure. Uh, and the hope really is, and as some of you or many of you actually have already picked up, is, is that it is potentially an opportunity for creative transformation. But the reason I'm not feeling particularly optimistic about this particular this case is that uh, there have been other opportunities also which have happened earlier, maybe not as as graphic as this one. You know, and and we seem as a as a kind of species, we seem to have let those opportunities pass. Uh, this is really the the grim reality of where we are today. Uh, that we actually, as a planet. We are facing a real health emergency right now. I mean, all the indicators, if you look at our dashboard, so to speak, our health dashboard, it's, it's not looking good. Um, all, all, all the parameters are going through the roof and getting worse as we speak. There is no real flattening of the curve that's taking place currently. Uh, and worse still, we seem to be completely locked into a, a kind of like a vicious cycle, uh, which is just taking us you know, into a worse and worse place with every spiral. And as you can see in this, I mean, this is just one of the many kind of diagrams that explain what's actually going on. But uh, uh, I think uh, for me, the key area that I'm sort of interested in is the one you see on the bottom of the screen, which is consumerism, uh, which is part of this vicious cycle of, of that is dragging the earth kind of and the planet down and all of us along with it. Whether and because design is such an integral field or activity which feeds into and feeds consumerism, uh, what can we do about this? And if at all there is something that we can do. So for me, one thing is very clear that we have a, a kind of uh, inherited and perpetuated a, a kind of operating system for our planet, which is which has run its course, which has become long obsolete now, at least two decades, maybe even longer than that. And it needs urgent replacement. I mean, we're really in a, in a very, very bad situation. And unless we do this in a, in a kind of hurry, uh, it is probably going to crash anytime at all now. But the interesting part for me also, and like I'm sure for many of you, is that because of the sort of peculiar circumstance that we are in, thanks to the pandemic, we have started seeing glimpses of what is even now possible, despite the Earth's health being in, in this condition that it is. If you give it a bit of a breather, a bit of, bit of relief, um, or respite rather, 
uh, you actually start seeing changes happening in front of our own sort of you know our very eyes in the same temporality and, and, and i'm sure many of you have seen and re re registered these kind of uh, really amazing almost surreal images and information as it has come onto our screens so uh, this perhaps is is uh, and in fact that's the the funny part i mean i, I don't know how many of you have seen this meme but the, the joke is that the pollution levels are so low now that you can actually see Toronto uh, from Ludiano. But uh, the point is that, uh, you know, this is happening because we have a gun to our heads. And the gun really is the gun of the coronavirus. Um, so only because of this extreme condition or this extreme kind of disaster scenario, we're actually, uh, you know, seeing some, some indication or some positive signs emerging from, from the otherwise the disastrous doom and gloom scenario. The question therefore is, uh, if this is still achievable even in today's condition, even if, if we can start sort of healing back the planet, why are we not able to do so without this kind of worry, right? That's the kind of fundamental question. And the answer is actually this. I mean, the thing, the biggest ob obstruction, the biggest barrier is ourselves, is human beings. Uh, and, and it's our, uh, in particular, uh, it's our mind, it's the way our brain is wired, it's how we perceive, it's how we evaluate, it's how we make decisions. It, it's flawed. The thing is, like the Earth's OS that we have created ourselves, our own OS, our own operating system is also very, very primitive, um, and which has served us well for, for many, many kind of millions of years, maybe. But today, it is already kind of failing us because we are still hijacked by a mental model, which you see at the bottom of the iceberg out there on the, on the right of the screen, uh, which are basically primitive and which, which compel us to behave or respond to stimuli in ways that are actually detrimental and, and self-destructive to us. Here is just a kind of simple graphic that illustrates where we are stuck. Uh, one of the biggest kind of mental models or behavioral loops or cognitive biases that we are hijacked by is the self-validation bias or confirmation bias, right? Which is where everything that we now uh, search find and uh, receive or in, in, you know register uh, basically it's all about reinforcing our own beliefs our own values our own favorite theories and conspiracy theories even for the matter and as you can see on the top right it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where basically our mental model uh, you know it, it, it sort of uh, filters out gra glass half full half empty glass is just a graphic to illustrate you know, how we become dog, and that's the problem with it, that we are not, uh, we become so fierce, but we can have a completely opposing or contrary view of the same reality, of the same phenomenon as in the half full half. This, in fact, is, is where we are right now. I mean, if you look at the, the nuts and bolts of it, we are locked in a kind of cycle of behavior that we never signed up for. I don't remember anybody saying, you know, is this how you want to lead the rest of your life? Uh, but somewhere that's where I'm, I find myself stuck in. And that's really the part of the problem is that we are doing things that we don't really, we didn't really choose for. We perhaps, if given a choice, we may not even continue doing. Uh, and yet we are unable to really, uh, you know, escape from this and or find an alternative and so on. So the question again is, you know, wh why does this keep Happen. Why, why is not? I mean, if everybody agrees on this, if at least a large number of people think that this is stupid and we should not be doing this and we should be living a different kind of life, why aren't we able to just get on with it? And for that, I have this kind of very simple, simple, perhaps simplistic diagram, which I'm calling the four ships model. And are, it requires these four kind of elements to all lock in together and synchronize with each other for us to cross, as you can see in the middle of the, in the background, at the tipping point. So the tipping point, as you can see from the metaphor, is basically a place, after, a point after which you have to stop pushing the rock uphill. And it sort of starts going on its own, or thanks to gravity. And those four ships are uh, citizenship on the top, leadership at the bottom, entrepreneurship on the left, and research ship on knowledge or expertise on, on the right. When these four kind of components start, you know, complementing each other and working in sync with each other rather than pulling away from each other or pulling each, each of them apart, then is the best hope or scenario that we have when we can actually replace our OS with, with a more sustainable one as well. And perhaps the one that we actually would like to see. Uh, so let's do a quick review of where we stand. On the topic of leadership, that's a very tricky topic and, and I just don't want to get into a, a debate right now, but I do want to show you this little video uh, of this ex-president of Uruguay called Jose Mujica uh, and, and just see what kind of leadership is possible even in this day and age. Soy Jose Mujica, pero no ahora por ser presidente. 
Esto lo pensamos mucho, pasamos más de 10 años de soledad en el carabozo y tuvimos tiempo, tuvimos 7 años sin leer un libro y tuvimos mucho tiempo para pensar y descubrimos esto. O logras ser feliz con poco y liviano de equipaje porque la felicidad está dentro tuyo o no logras nada. Esto no es una apología de la pobreza, esto es una apología de la sobriedad. Y, pero como hemos inventado una sociedad de consumo, consumista, y la economía tiene que crecer, porque si no crece es una tragedia, inventamos una montaña de consumo superfluo, y hay que tirar y, y vivir comprando y tirando, y lo que estamos gastando es tiempo de vida. Porque cuando yo compro algo, o tú, no lo compras con plata, lo compras con el tiempo de vida que tuviste que gastar para tener esa plata. Pero con esta diferencia, la única cosa que no se puede comprar es la vida. La vida se gasta y es miserable gastar la vida para perder la libertad. It is pitiful to waste one's life and freedom that way. Uh, this is a contemporary leader. Uh, who, uh, I mean, there's a whole story to him. He was in solitary confinement for, for a long time and, and he's come up with this amazing insight and he actually became president as well. This actually talks about the citizenship perspective is what can we do as citizens? What can we look, look out ahead or look out for? Uh, and there are initiatives which are being taken even at the citizenship level. People are becoming aware of this. People are becoming conscious of this. We are sort of realizing intuitively that The, the aim of our life is not really to sort of get locked into this production and consumption cycle, but into pursuing quality, into pursuing other kind of positive values and affirmative values that, uh, you know, nurture each other and nurture the planet as well. Uh, more importantly, it's a kind of need for authenticity. Oops, the good news that I have from the, the right side, the technology side, the research and technology side, is that we actually have almost everything that we need to replace our OS. We understand the whole principles now of circular design and sustainable production and consumption. We have the science behind it. We have also have almost all the technology behind it. Take a look. We have ways by which entire communities, including towns, can go from uh, you know the current way in which we live to, to zero energy living or to sustainable living. We have zero waste technologies. We have zero energy buildings, blueprints, plans ready for almost any environment or any climate or any weather conditions, uh, the answers are all there. Um, so the, the in, in principle, the solutions all exist uh, uh, for, for almost every circumstance. So many of those boxes, those four quadrants that I showed you, they are actually well on the way to being fulfilled. The most important thing is from the designer's perspective, we also know how to do this without holding a gun to our head. We know how to tap into human sort of motivation and human impulse and human attract affinity for attractiveness, how to make stuff desirable, how to change or replace a, a bad habit with a better one or a good one. We have the know-how. Um, and here, for those of you who, who don't, uh, may have not have seen this, here is a small video which shows uh, a small example of behavior change brought out through, through by actually invoking fun.
thanks, actually thanks a lot, Arvin, for, for sharing this particular video because this is definitely um, one of the best <laughs> videos that we have definitely used in, in uh, as an example. And Fun Theory has many of such videos on how can we yep. mix uh, uh, fun and like uh, have a behavioral analysis of people and uh, yes. design something that is that is a lot of fun for people and then also gets the purpose served. So I have, uh, I'd just like to like quickly uh, reflect back on, on what you have mentioned already around uh, uh, the planet's health, first of all. I mean, the two sides of it. One is definitely we are in a crisis, uh, a health crisis, major health crisis. And the other side is, uh, is basically where we are uh, kind of see where we can see a lot of positive sides and the image that you had with uh, many of the things that have been changing. Uh, for good owing to the situation that we have right now. Cool. So I think this is this is definitely uh, something that we look forward to. And I think this is also uh, towards um, a good, I, I see this as a good start, definitely, because um, uh, even though it happened through a gun on the head, it at least made us realize that it is possible. And within a few weeks, we can make this possible. And within a few weeks, things can change. Uh, exactly. It's just a matter of choice. And uh, yeah, I think I also totally agree with you when you mentioned the cognitive uh, biases that we have, uh, our, 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 our choice to be blind to th anything that is not uh, in confirmation with what we already believe is true. So that's definitely another um, way on how we basically ignore things just because uh, uh, they are not in alignment with our existing belief system. So, uh, and, and that's a also a great example, uh, leadership example uh, from Jose Mukia video that you played. So uh, would, uh, let's, I think we, sh we should also, um, what do you think of how leaders and visionaries uh, are doing right now. Obviously, they are doing under compulsion uh, on whatever it's happening. But what is it in leaders and visionaries to do and also to, um, say, learn from what they are doing under compulsion and graduate to thinking on the lines of, uh, say, doing it willingly or willfully? Yeah, well, I was talking with a, with a friend just this morning who actually is yeah. a coach for CEOs. So, so he does executive kind of coaching and uh, he was also remarking something which I agree with and that I can share here, which is that uh, currently we seem to have, a, a, in the popular imagination, uh, an idea of a leader who takes, who is a man of action. Uh, and it's often, I mean, it's almost uh, inspired from superhero movies or action movies. Um, and, 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 you know, so we, we really are, are all out for, for people like that. But he was saying that actually good leadership is, is uh, not somebody who acts instantly or very fast or rapidly when presented with a kind of challenge, uh, but actually pauses, thinks or reflects, maybe consults and then acts. Um, and I think that's that's really the kind of situation which we are in today. Maybe that's why I voted pessimistic because uh, we, are, we are still operating under certain habits or mental models um, that, that, you know, although we mean well and we can see the solution in front of us, we can see what can be actually, uh, you know, what needs to be done. But a lot of the deep-rooted uh, psychology and subconscious kind of uh, programming that we have uh, is still going to, uh, in my kind of, uh, and I hope I'm wrong, uh, is still going to sort of make or compel us to make choices uh, which are actually not going to uh, help in, in the achieving of this kind of scenario. Yeah, so I, I was just wanting to uh, take uh, another uh, audience poll on what yes. they think about uh, creative leaders and, and visionaries and are we, are we lacking it or do we have them in abundance but not right. fairly That's utilized? So, yeah, yeah. so my, my, I, I, I disagree with this. I think we don't lack leaders and leadership. I think we, uh, we lack uh, prioritization right now uh, on what's on priority. What's your opinion on that? No, in fact, uh, uh, in fact I, I, have, I, I voted uh, the first as well that, I, that, that we have a lack of leadership. But I agree with the point that you're making, which is that the leadership, even though potentially it's sitting there, it's not doing what, what it should be doing. And I think the answer to that really is the top box, is proactive citizenship and consumerism. I think if we take charge of our leaders instead of waiting to be led by them, because leaders respond to people, to public demand. And yeah. that's why I think even on the left half, the entrepreneurship and business section, business is not going to change unless we want it to change. 
And I think it's that chicken and egg kind of cycle that has to be broken somewhere. We can't endlessly go on waiting for leaders because they are picking up cues from us. And unless we give them the cues and the signals that we want a change and that we, we will support them if they bring out a kind of radical change of the kind that we would hope to see, um, I think we, the leaders will emerge from nowhere. The leaders are all there. The know-how is there. The will is there. The, the understanding is there. Uh, what is perhaps missing is just some spark to actually trigger the whole behavior. And that's why my point here uh, in, the, in the illustration here is that we just, we are reaching the tipping point. We are not yet there. Uh, we still have to push hard. We are still having to work really against the grain in some sense. But I think if we keep all the four quadrants, if we keep at it, and especially we in the first first top quadrant itself as citizens and consumers, because regardless of whether we are business people or scientists or politicians, we are citizens and humans first and foremost. Uh, and that is our first sort of obligation to ourselves. So if we are actually, if we take that at, in our hands and keep pushing aggressively uh, in terms of insisting and, and uh, you know, performing our citizenship duties, uh, and by citizenship, I don't mean nations, I mean as a planetary citizen, um, and showing through our consumerism, showing, conveying to business the kind of choices that we are making and that we are not making, I think there will be a, a kind of response will follow. So it, this has to be a demand-led movement rather than supply-led movement. Uh, as long as we wait for supplies to change, it's not going to happen. Uh, but the moment we, we take demand into our hands individually and collectively, supplies will change. That, that's, my, that's my kind of uh, understanding as of now. Sure. So, 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 do you think can we like can, can we as citizens and uh, uh, I would say not I mean regular talking about the regular public uh, can we attain a tipping point I mean through our action items and not waiting absolutely. for the leadership to act absolutely absolutely I, like I said I think the fact that we are citizens the fact that we have a voice is is our first kind of power that we have superpower that we have secondly we have money uh, governments run on tax business runs on profits. And yeah. the money comes from our pockets. So our spending is like a political tool that we have to influence uh, or to insist on what we want and to, to sort of, in a sense, pressurize what we don't want. So I think we have not really realized our own potential or our own power that we hold in our hands and in our pockets or in our, in our mouths, in our voices. So, um, and I think if you use the combination of that, our voice and our sort of money power in a kind of united way or in a cohesive way, I think we can achieve transformation very fast. So, uh, sure. Uh, so, Avin, next, I think, that, so my next question to you uh, is, uh, how do you think we are going to achieve this? Or how, this is, how is this going to work? Uh, something, something like, how, how do we get uh, a mass action, just like we have yeah. coronavirus everywhere in the world? Uh, how do we they make this tipping point to become a trend across the globe? Because that's what is needed. Uh, I think Absolutely. in bits and pieces, we, we already have it, but it's not working. So yeah, uh, what's your comment on that? Absolutely. I, I, think, I think the answer in a kind of very kind of one word answer is innovation. And I think um, at, at every level, in every quadrant that we are seeing out here, uh, if we introduce innovation, uh, you know, in small steps or in at a kind of radical or disruptive scale, uh, it all adds up together. So we need to create some kind of a critical mass of innovation at every level in terms of our citizenship practices, in terms of our business and entrepreneurship practices, in terms of our leadership practices. And if we, in that sort of, uh, if that aggregated innovation uh, is, I think if, if, if it works with this common cause and common understanding of where we want to be, um, because I'm actually letting the scientists and the techn technology people off the hook here because they have already exceeded their brief. I think the research and the R&D and technology world is already sitting there with all the answers that we need. No, there's no more questions left in, in that department. But as citizens, as business and as uh, political leadership, we still need to catch up with, with that kind of know-how, with the latest know-how. Sure. So I think let's continue with uh, uh, your, your slides. Uh, that's yes, something, so uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to comment on uh, a, a couple of things that I really found interesting sure, in the conversation. Sure, sure. Sure. No, absolutely. Wonderful. So uh, this is the last section in any case. And, and uh, let me, this, this to me is the kind of uh, opportunity that we have are staring at right now is really to sort of un unlock or unleash the potential of innovative uh, entrepreneurship, uh, really, really, you know, make sustainability a kind of uh, um, uh, almost like a cottage industry. 
um, and, and you know, built on top of new economics and new new potentials of technology and so on. I think the potential is very very high right now. Um, people can, and I, I know for a fact that they are already uh, moving into this at a very massive scale. Uh, again, like I said, to look at the big companies or corporations to lead the way, or politicians to lead the way, uh, we don't need to do that. We can start at our own scale, at our own local level, or at our own community level, and actually start initiating change in small ways with the faith and confidence that it all adds up. It will all add up. So the more we actually perpetuate this, both formally, like in, in an institutional manner, and informally, as in our own personal capacity, uh, the more it will actually come together. And the tipping point will, will reach the tipping point much faster. And I have a couple of small kind of example videos out here of these kind of startups. I mean, there are many, many more. These are just a couple that came to my mind. Uh, this is one from Uganda. Let's have a look at it, a short video. Very organic. Fashion designer Bobby Kalati is showing off a signature fashion creation made from Ugandan tree bark cloth, an oversized coat that is actually much lighter than it appears. He points to parts of the cloth where branches and limbs once grew, creating natural tears during the cloth making process that had to be meticulously stitched. And that's why you have certain parts um, where you see these sort of stitches. Um, all over. You've got that here, you've got that up here, and that makes it very um, special. No single piece of tree bark cloth is exactly alike, and that, says Kaladi, is what makes his pieces luxury items. They should be one of a kind, and I think that's sort of the kind of message I'm trying to, you know, give with this, with this coat. The fashion designer lives in Germany, where he recently featured his bark cloth designs in a runway show. He grew up in Sudan and Uganda, where the ancient craft of bark cloth making is so highly regarded that in 2008, the UN Cultural Agency, UNESCO, proclaimed it a cultural heritage of humanity. Kaladi says he is fascinated by how bark is stripped off a fig or matuba tree. The tree is then wrapped in banana leaves to help protect it. The stripped bark is pounded with guava tree mallets until it is about one-tenth its original width. It is dried in the sun, giving it a terracotta hue, but it can also be dyed many different colors. In Uganda and other parts of Africa, it is used to make a range of textiles. In addition, Sana Giteja uses it in his art. I love to use it because of its color and texture and of course the story is very interesting for me and inspirational. Kalani works with farmers in Uganda to get the bark cloth and then he modifies it. At this point he says it's not quite ready for snowy and rainy days. Obviously you know to make it more adaptable to different um, weather conditions we are going to have to use products from for example Brazil for you know um, latex from Brazil for example. Kalani says he even finds inspiration from the look of the bark cloth and uses that to create pieces like this silk jacket. We cannot reproduce it, um, but we, what we can do is try to um, reproduce or emphasize the structure, the unique structure that it has. Kaladi is hoping one day tree bark cloth will be used as an alternative to leather. I'm really curious myself to see in what direction it's going to go. Um, I'm, I'm curious and I'm looking forward to the challenges as well. He hopes ultimately this ancient technique will be used to help create a brand new fabric of the future. Mary Alice Salinas, VOA News, Washington. So I chose this is because, uh, you know, there's a beautiful blend of traditional know-how, uh, almost popular of folk culture in a sense, and, uh, you know, high fashion, high technology, high design, uh, all coming together and working to the, together in a kind of very, very sustainable way, in a way that is a win-win kind of uh, way of, of uh, you know, creating new, new kind of uh, modes of, of practices of consumption. Another example is from India, and for many of you, this is a familiar person, So, but it's still important to share her story. Uh, this is Poonam Kasturi with The Daily Dump. Poonam Bir Kasturi calls herself Compost Vali and proudly so. This National Institute of Design graduate began her journey in the social enterprise space with Industry Crafts Foundation. She then co-founded Trishti School of Art and Design and worked there for 12 years. 
In that time, she observed the decay that rapid urbanization and the spike in population density were bringing to the garden city. Poonam decided to bring design thinking to waste management at a household level and so was born Daily Dump in 2008. Her focus right from the beginning has been to create a product that's simple, unthreatening and not perceived as dirty. Working with a community of potters near Bangalore, Poonam and her team have designed 50 variants of these terracotta products that can be used by families and now even housing complexes. I feel I, we have got a product that really is world class and uh, it's very suited to India, it's made in India, designed in India for India and they look very beautiful so they don't look like waste at all and there are builders now in Bangalore who've put it up right there in front of their communities and uh, everybody knows, the children know, the children interact, when we do training we call all of them, we get them to put in the waste. So it's something that we want to do is we want to build the pride of you know you're looking after waste it's not something that's ugly and tucked away at the back and nobody knows about it it's up there in front so I think for us the the scale when we're talking about the numbers to answer that question is about how much can you infect people who start taking pride with over 25,000 committed users including families businesses and other institutions daily dumps products have directly impacted more than two lakh individuals the humble terracotta pots keep 20,000 tons of organic waste out of landfills every day, contributing to safer working conditions for informal waste collectors, sustaining a dying craft and increasing incomes of the potter communities. Over the next three years, Poonam wants to bring better technology and training to the clusters of potters that she works with across India. She wants to build the next level of solutions for segregation of sanitary waste, mercury, build a large organic waste system and perhaps even disrupt the ecotourism space. So uh, again, a great example um, of, of uh, again, if you go back to the kind of quadrants that I'm talking about, the four ships, uh, you know, as citizens, if we, if we, encourage entrepreneurship of this kind and change our consumption patterns, change our consumption habits so that actually, um, I mean, reduce them in one, one sense and also change them so that they become more sustainable or, you know, part of a circular economy in, in another sense. Um, uh, and if a sufficient number of us start doing this, it sends out signals to politicians and to leaders and to business uh, tycoons as well, that there's a change happening, people are demanding something, there's a market opportunity opening out here, people are really going for this in a big way, uh, and I, trust me, leadership will follow. Uh, so rather than waiting for leaders to actually pave the way for us, if we, through our individual and collective behavior and actions, um, can actually make make this kind of, uh, put change the, the, the dynamics of, of economics, of business, and, and of political leadership, we can actually bring about that change. The, this is the final slide. This really shows how musicians come together and perform together. That's really the spirit that we need to, uh, you know, inculcate for the future, where it's not really about competition, but it's about working together in a fiercely competitive way. Um, and, and if we can are able to sort of synchronize this innovation in a viral way, almost in the way that coronavirus has done, uh, we can actually see systemic change coming up much faster. Right. Sure. Thanks, Arvind. Thank, thank you so much for like a super insightful session. So the first, I mean, first we looked at the positive and obviously we are in a crisis, but then we looked at the positive side of the crisis. Um, and then we looked at what we can attain in a matter of few weeks and uh, what many people are already doing in order to attain this. So I think this, I mean, I, I mean, the sequence is super in inspiring for me to probably, I'm, I'm thinking of a few ideas that I've had the back, at the back of my mind or something super, super inspiring for me. And thanks for the amazing uh, slide and the session. So um, I'll, I think we will move ahead with a few questions that I, we have from the audience. Yes. Uh, Arvind and I will quickly take a look at the Q&A. Arvind, I think there's a yes. Q&A segment on your screen. And right. uh, you can definitely uh, take a look at uh, and the questions. Yes. Uh, one interesting question that we that I see is: Is it only this responsibility of leaders? And uh, my opinion is that the answer could be yeah, both yes and no, uh, right. and that depends on who we are calling leaders. Are we 
calling the politician the leaders? Are we calling the activists the leaders? Or, or, or are we calling the, all the citizens the leaders? And uh, how do we see leadership? So that's my opinion on it. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I completely agree with that. I think I think we have to change this mindset again. We uh, like I talked about the obsolete kind of mindset that we carry within us. We have this kind of an obsolete mindset where we are the the you know somewhere down below and the leaders are somewhere there, and we have to constantly wait for them to to you know show us the way, or they are more knowledgeable than us. Actually, that's not true at all. Uh, and I think this picture needs to be inverted. Uh, in a democracy, especially, it is yeah. the citizens. It is we who are the leaders. Remember that. Uh, and the people we put in place, we vote for, actually are meant to be our representatives. Act on that. And if they don't do their job, then we can fire them, and we should fire them, uh, and we should appoint new leaders in that if that is the case. So we have to change that. And although, of course, I'm saying in a slightly simplified manner, it's not that we have the ability to do so like that or that that it is very simple like that. But as citizens, and like I said, it's not just through our vote, but through our voice, through our kind of articulation and through what we speak in public and to each other, uh, that and through our purchasing, through our consumption behavior, through our entrepreneurial activity. These are all ways by which we can actually start making a change and send a signal down the line or up the line, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, that we that we need change and we are impatient for change. And I think, and I think, you will soon realize that if you're able to escape this mindset of waiting for leaders and feeling completely powerless, um, then things can change pretty fast. You'll be really surprised. Yeah, and that's interesting how consumers can change the way uh, the economies work and, and the market Absolutely. works. Uh, so um, quickly, in the interest of time, Arvind, I would like to like talk more about this. But then in the interest of time, I think there's a one question which is specifically sure. directed to you. Yeah. So, which is uh, talking about the critical mass of uh, for innovation, uh, yeah. the technologists, you mentioned that the technologists have most of the know-how, right. but uh, we as citizens and our leadership need to do a, do a lot to catch up with it. Uh, yeah. What roles can designers and design educators play to bridge this gap? Right. Uh, that's Praveen and hi Praveen. Uh, I think my answer to that is that, uh, the know-how is not sitting in a, a distant remote ivory tower anywhere and especially the kind of know-how we are talking about discussing out here which is about sustainability and so on a lot of it is already in the commons in the open source space or uh, pretty much in the accessible space it is not really proprietary secretive kind of secretly held know-how of course there is a lot of that as well but i think there's sufficient know-how sitting in the public domain so that's part number one but it is true that it is technical uh, and it's not easily kind of understandable to a lay person. So there is a need to bridge the gap, as you mentioned. And I think uh, designers and design educators have, uh, uh, you know, I mean, they, they they have the capacity and the capability to actually understand both sides of the spectrum. On one side, they have the ability to understand technology and technical technicalities. On the other side, they have the capability of understanding human behavior and human desire and human economics. Also, in a sense, they can actually bridge this gap perhaps the most effectively, rather than people who represent one or the other uh, poles. I mean, in a sense, I think, I mean, for example, my training or my practice as a designer has given me an ability to, to really, literally to act as an intermediary between science or technology and R&D in a sense, and between ordinary human, uh, you know, normal life and behavior and thoughts and emotions and so on, on the other hand, and actually have the gift and the, the privilege of being able to conceptualize business models, conceptualize products, conceptualize services that actually can bridge this gap and make it accessible. Yeah, and that's, that's super interesting on the uh, role of designers, uh, especially uh, I think from the poll results that, I've had, that we have had. Um, I think it's really time, especially in times of, I think uncertainty is the best time for uh, designers to take action because that's what they are trying I, to do. I just want to add one more point, uh, which, which perhaps I omitted to mention in the previous thing, but I've made a point of it earlier, which is that I, I think there is an opportunity now to be entrepreneurs. And, and I don't only mean entrepreneurs in the business sense, there's a whole category called social entrepreneurship, which is really about a social impact as being the outcome and not really profitability. Yeah. Of course, it means it does mean that you, you, you are financially sustainable, but that's not your primary goal or primary objective. So any kind of entrepreneurship, whether it's for profit or for social impact or for environmental impact, uh, is is perhaps the way ahead. And, and 
maybe that's that's the kind of is that uh, in addition to uh, you know creating of creating or finding opportunities to create new products services business etc there is also an opportunity for creative people to actually get into entrepreneurship in a big way and not really after they they get their education or training or whatever it might be not really look look for jobs but but really define their own jobs make their own jobs make their own careers and in 5 years time i can guarantee that those companies that you were chasing after for jobs will come looking for you sure so yeah interesting insight so uh, we have had a rush of questions in the last 5 minutes and then there are too many yeah, of them time to i'm not up. sure yeah <laughs> so I, i'm not sure if we can answer all of them but thanks for your interest and arvind the can go ahead with answering your right. next question i mean i'm i'm actually completely floored by looking at the kind of questions that are coming up they are fantastic i really wish we had about you know half a day to actually organize a proper seminar and everybody could actually participate I, i'm really also equally sort of uh, eager to hear uh, many of these people who have actually posted the questions or their thoughts really uh, and in a more elaborate way i mean i'm i'm not really here in the capacity of the subject expert at all on the subject so some of the questions that some of you are asking in terms of uh, you know what happens to economics what happens to new kind of economics in the in the coming scenario i'm not an economist so i don't really have an answer for that but i think um, that that there is the what i will definitely say is that thanks to the the pandemic thanks to coronavirus uh, an extreme situation has been created where all the kind of rules of the game have been put on hold uh, or or disrupted even uh, and yeah. and i'm not saying it's all good at all uh, many many bad things are happening as well but it's showing us that you know somehow if there was a kind of lockdown you know in a sense imposed on the world as, as in one shot it it could bring about the opportunity to to reboot to reinitialize in a, in a very very kind of uh, in the way that we all want perhaps and in the way that we also already know like i said so it's not even that we don't know what needs to be done so that i think is for me is the biggest uh, uh, you know aha moment of of this current period that we are going through in which there are a lot of other moments which are not so great uh, uh, so really what it boils down to is can we use this as a as a trigger to really assert and affirm what we believe what we stand for and and not be not be fatalistic not be cynical not be disheartened uh, which we we perhaps the reason for us to have been all all along um, uh, but but use this almost as a provocation to to speak up and and finally not wait for the system to change but start changing the system in your own capacity in your own uh you know pocket or bubble of influence whether it's social media whether it's your rwa whether it's your college campus or a small business or large corporation whichever in sphere of influence that you inhabit um and that's really my job my aim here in this talk is not really i, I don't have a how to manual that i can you know distribute to everyone but my, i'm here as an evangelist i'm here to basically try and you know inspire and motivate all of us including myself uh to actually start becoming much more proactive in 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 my fullest capacity as a human being so as a citizen as a teacher as a student as a consumer as an entrepreneur or service provider all these various roles or hats that i wear i think there's an opportunity to really push now uh, and this kind of uh, pandemic trick is most provided in a, an excuse for us to now behave with a sort of urgency uh that that okay it's got to be done now we just cannot wait any longer and you know we are reminded of of the 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 young activist Greta Thunberg which which she is a controversial figure yeah. but one of the thing that i really sort of admire about her is that she's trying to inject urgency into this thing and and she represents the voice of of the future generations of the people who will inherit the planet you yeah. know and and i think that's that's absolutely absolutely crucial to keep in mind i mean are we really prepared to to you know leave the planet in a shape that is as bad as it is or even worse thanks to our inaction thanks to our kind of you know continued behavior in the same way as we have done all along yeah thanks thanks for uh, taking time to answer uh, these questions in detail um uh, sorry to people that we are not in interest of time i think so it's time for us to wrap up and uh, we might not be able to take up all the questions but we'll definitely get back to you and connect you to arvind over emails uh, yes. to everyone who has uh, uh, put in questions 
So uh, with this, I would um, quickly like to uh, play a video. Uh, and before that, I'd like to thank you, Arvind, again for an amazing session. You okay. kept on saying that you have a pessimistic uh, um, opinion around the situation. But I think uh, this particular session is quite optimistic and the way we look at it. So uh, really let's, uh, yes. yeah. uh, I'll, I look forward to see all of you next week, Saturday, 3 p.m. Uh, with, with our next speaker, uh, Alok Nandi. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining, and see you again soon next Saturday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.